Good afternoon, good afternoon, and welcome to Table Talk with Brenda Perryman. My name is Brenda Perryman, and we're going to have a great show today, including an interview with Joyce Garrett, who is an advisor to President Obama, uh, not Joyce Garrett, excuse me, Valerie Jarrett, who is an advisor to President Barack Obama, and she called from the White House, and we did an interview with her. And before I begin, I'm going to introduce you or let them introduce your, themselves. We have a couple of guest co-hosts and one of our permanent co-hosts here. And so I will start with Mr. Darren Calhoun. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Darren Calhoun. I'm a supervisory uh, investigator and program analyst from the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the Detroit Field Office. Ooh. <laughs> How do I follow that? I'm Chris Sumrall, and I'm a servant for the citizens of the city of Detroit. Uh, my name is Adam Olier, and I'm the Vice President of Hans Woodlands. That's really interesting. It, it's the Vice President of Hans... Woodlands. Woodlands. Mm -hmm. Woodlands. That's a, I thought it was called Hans Farm. Well, we're trying to rebrand a little bit. Farms makes you think more like we're growing corn or have <laughs> pigs and things like that, but it's just trees. It's hardwood trees. So Woodlands is a little bit more accurate. Oh, okay. Uh, there are a couple of great stories, you know, at, Part of what we do at the beginning of the show, we take something from On This Day in African American Life in Detroit by Ken Coleman, one of our co-hosts. And on this day, March 14th, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. offers a speech titled The Other America, the Other America at Gross Point High School. He is hounded and heckled by Breakthrough, a Detroit right-wing group opposed to open housing and the peace movement. The speech lays out the inequities in public education between blacks and whites. The civil rights leader will, be, will later speak at Central United Methodist Church, which is downtown. It will be King's last visit to the metro area. He will be assassinated three weeks later. Isn't it funny how we're still talking about uh, equality in education, still talking about it this many years later. And lastly, just another note, in 1999, Curtis Jones joins the Ancestors. He was 50. Jones was a boys basketball sensation at Northwestern High School, graduating in 1968. The National Basketball Association superstar George Gervin, an Eastern High School graduate, once called Jones the greatest player ever seen. In 1982, Jones filed a lawsuit for $15 million, arguing that he couldn't read but was pushed into North Idaho Junior College to exploit his basketball talent and further his defendant's careers. Defendants are University of Michigan head coach Johnny Orr, Northwestern High School basketball coach Fred Snowden, and North Idaho Junior College officials. Jones, who has been in and out of mental, mental hospitals, did not prevail in the lawsuit. I remember that. And, but it did start opening the eyes that, you know, so many of these players were getting pushed through college just because of their, their prowess, you know? And that's unfortunate. And now, I don't think it's that much better. It's a little better, but not that much better. And since we're talking about it, what do you all think about um, college education and basketball and football right now. Do you think that they're kind of still pushing some of these students? Well, I think that any time that you have big business um, that's tied to education, there's going to be some exploitation. And uh, I think that uh, maybe it was a, a little bit more out in the open or blatant back then, but I, I definitely think it still exists today. Um, you know, even down to the high school level, and maybe even younger, we can see that these, these student athletes um, receive a certain type of treatment, um, you know, almost conditioning them to uh, not take education as seriously sometimes as they should. Well, I, I played college football, and I think one of the, the discussions we don't have enough is that we really do make sports very different than other sports, you know, than other items. So if I played in the band, if I had musical ability, or if I was a singer or a dancer, I could go and do that, and I don't need school. But to be a successful athlete, you have to graduate from high school at a minimum. And to play football, you have to go to college. You know, so it's a very different thing when you say, am I pushing this kid through? 
or are we educating him? Nobody said, well, we're pushing Michael Jackson through school so that he could perform because he didn't have to go to school. He just didn't do that. You know, the same thing you see with all the child actors. But if you're an athlete, you have to go to school and you have to become a student athlete and no other talent requires that. So when you talk about not educating them, that's the thing that we aren't doing. We aren't educating folks. And it just happens to be that it came to the head because they were a great athlete. And, and at some point, and, and I agree with you, but at some point, you know, the, these young people are in school. So they, yeah. they, you would want to think that they would take advantage of the opportunity that they have while they're there. I, I know there are a lot of chances, they, a lot of times they push them through, and, and it still goes on today because there are magazines out, out right now for fifth graders and sixth graders uh, to join AAU teams, and they rank these children based on their athletic prowess. So, um, but it, you, you would hope that there's a parent saying, you're there, you're in school, get an education. Well, a lot of times some parents don't even care if their kid finishes college either because uh, they're playing, they're banking on this child making it to a pro basketball league. I know that, I've seen it. And I, you know, have a son who played college basketball and everything. And my whole thing was I wanted him to graduate. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand you have some players who are really so-called great players, and they probably can leap right out of college and into the pros, and some do. But the majority don't. Right. And I know of a, a lot of high school or college players who played four years and never got their degree. I think that brings us to the discussion about folks actually graduating. I mean, when you right. look at the achievement gap, when you look at how many young folks are graduating from high school in the city of Detroit, and then how many of them matriculate on to college, and then how many of those graduate from college. So we only look at it when it comes to athletes, but this is something that's happening with everybody. We aren't educating kids, they aren't graduating, they aren't matriculating, and at every juncture, more and more people you know, lose. Why do you think uh, that is? Well, well I, I think that it, it comes, it, it becomes a bigger story because there are people that are profiting off of these students. Mm -hmm. profit, and exactly. if you just have, a, have, have a, a body of students that don't graduate for whatever reason, there isn't this machine that's capitalizing and creating billion dollar industry off of these student athletes. And I think that that's where people's conscience are, are, you know, it's kind of stinging them a little bit because they're saying somebody's getting rich off these kids and these kids should at least be prepared, um, you know, very minimally by receiving the education that they thought they would get. That's just for the athlete, though. Yeah. What about the other group of kids that are not athletes that don't get an opportunity to graduate and don't keep on going? What's going on with those? I think that's what you were saying. Absolutely. What's going on with those children? And, and, and what's, but then you think, what's the other industry that's being made for them? that's being built in every city and every town is the prison system. Yeah. And that's, that's the pipeline. If you're not going into school, then you gotta go somewhere. And, right, right. And, and well, what's so unfortunate sometimes too is the parents don't really investigate the schools that their children right. are in. But I don't think that they should. I don't think they should have to, is what oh, I well, mean. Well, but they don't, I, right at this juncture, they should. But the, the point is, public education in this nation in this state and in our city should not be designed about whether or not what you're a good is. parent right. because if it is there's no point in doing it public education should be designed as if you're a horrible parent and i'm a horrible parent and we're all not going to do a good job with our kids so that the system says from a baseline if you come into school every day and you spend your eight or nine hours in class you're going to know how to balance your checkbook you're going to have the skills to read write and do everything you need to do to be a successful non-criminal. You could non depend on us. I mean, I'm a teacher. Uh, you could depend on us to educate your child. Yeah, because. But it's not like that right now, and it should become like that. I, I have an issue about some school systems saying we're doing parenting classes. I guess that's what they have to do, but what happened? How did we fall off like that? That uh, we have Tom on the line. Good afternoon, Tom. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You know, I don't know, I mean, because it, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and jump into this thing. Uh, on, <laughs> on the education post-high school, um, and I heard one of them said, well, you know, we're not educating, we're not graduating kids. After high school, that, in a manner of speaking, is an adult decision. I remember when I graduated, I went to Detroit Cathedral, graduated in 1966, and it, it was kind of like, not that my mother and father were riding me in high school, 
But, you know, it was kind of like when I, you know, I, I won a football scholarship to Wayne, and it was kind of like they backed off and says, okay, this is yours. You're the one that's going to have to pursue this. And I did. I did not come out in four years, but guess what? I came out about a year or so later, and I had a piece of paper in my hand. And I think that in terms of that scenario there, and just not with me, but it's up to that individual, you know, that goes there. Like I said, I won a scholarship to play ball. So in essence, I got paid to come down. I didn't get paid the kind of money I would have liked to have, mind you. But, you know, I, my mother and father didn't have to come out of my pocket. I didn't have to come out of my pocket. And, you know, so it's, it's incumbent upon that person to continue to pursue, you know, their education until the end. And I'm going to say this, and I'm going to go. And education is the most important investment that we will ever make. I'm gonna... Right. Go on, Tom. Oh, we're going to put you on hold, and we'll come right back. You know, and, and thank you, Tom, for your comment. Um, but I, you know, I respectfully... We'll come right back. Tom, Tom push it. He said push it. I, I respectfully think Tom is, is speaking from an idealistic perspective, meaning that once a kid graduates high school, that all of, all of a sudden now he's an adult. That's not true. We're still dealing with... Um, you know, in some instances, very, very young mind. And so they don't necessarily appreciate the value of, the, of education like they should at that time. And so it's important that that pressure still be levied on them mm -hmm. to, to continue to push forward because uh, you don't get some things a, a little bit until later on in life. And so to say, well, that's an adult, adult decision once you enter in, into uh, but college. He, per, perhaps his parents prepared him for that. It, it yeah. sounds like Ideally, that's what I'm saying. Like From an yeah. idealistic standpoint, Tom? that's true. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. okay. But, you know, in terms of my parents, um, like I said, through elementary school and through high school, you know, they watched me. They weren't writing me, okay? But, like, once I got my scholarship and I'd made my commitment to go down to Wayne, and my father was my biggest fan. I mean, this man, all through high school, he came after working, and Jaron Axel would come out to Jane Field and watch, watch me and the rest of the guys practice football. But, um, you know, but in terms of an adult decision, and I'm, I'm going to agree with you, the sir, in the middle, who took objection to me saying that it's an adult decision. No, at 17 and 18 years old, by law, yeah, you're an adult. But mind-wise, I mean, okay, come on, let's go ahead and get real. Whatever an adult is, okay, I'm 67, and I mean, uh, I think I qualify as being an adult. But, you know, and some kids, they have to have that hands-on kind of thing with them to, you know, kind of like push them through uh, to make sure that, you know, they get that degree because, I mean, in this day and age, if you are not qualified, I mean, you know, the days of back when I was a kid, you know, we, I had friends of mine had papers fixed. They went into Ford General Motors and Chrysler. They right. worked 30 mm -hmm. years. They weren't 50 years old, and they were retired. But, you know, in terms of that, you know, having a, a lot of brawn, and then I don't mean to be condescending or to, to besmirch anybody, and not a whole lot of brain upstairs, that is over. It's been over for a long time because, in the, you know, things are really technologically advanced. And if we don't have, I'm kind of going on another track here, but, you know, in terms of the city's comeback, there was an article it was in Sunday's paper on page or whatever it was. It was written by um, Mike Duggan and the woman who's with, uh, I can't recall, Tanya, it, Allen. Tanya Allen, that's who it was. And they said if Detroit's comeback is to happen, that young African-Americans will need need to be part of it. They are the key to it. But guess what? If they do not go out and prepare themselves for the jobs of the 21st century, guess what? The Detroit turnaround or comeback, it's going to happen without them. Oh, I've okay. taken up enough of your time. and I'm Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Um, the thing is that a lot of these children, and we, and we weren't even supposed to be discussing this, but this is important. They're in a certain environment. And if your environment doesn't endorse education, that becomes another fight. Because I've had students have to fight sometime to come to school and not have to stay home and babysit for their little sister or brother, you know. The, the parent, and with Tom, and probably with my mother and a bunch of you guys' uh, parents, there were expectations. Mm -hmm. 
you know, they didn't have to ride you because they knew, well, I was scared to do so bad in school. I had to do good, mm -hmm. you know. But I don't know. I just think it's, we just have to, and what um, Adam said, the schools should be able to handle it. Our educational system right now is like 30 something in the, in the world. Yeah. And, I mean, I think the other thing that we don't spend enough time talking about, and I, I think it's a generational thing, is the difference in, in education. I mean, Tom said he graduated and went to Wayne State on a scholarship. Okay, but if he hadn't, he could afford to pay for college. I couldn't today. My salary today yeah. is not anywhere near enough to have paid for my tuition in undergrad. You know, a lot of folks say, oh, well, you can, you can work the summer. And like my dad, my dad worked at the GM Proofing Grounds over the summer and paid for tuition at Eastern. My $65,000 a year tuition at Cornell I couldn't pay for it today. Right. You know, right. and so <clears throat> as we say to young folks and we say to folks, well, you need to go get that education. And they absolutely do because the numbers say that your earning potential is doubled with the bachelor's, is tripled with the master's and with the doctorate, you know, and so on and so forth. But the problem is in the near term, you don't see those returns because you're thinking, oh, I'm going to graduate with that $28,000 in debt. That is the statewide average. Right. And that, that means that it's going to take you almost 10 years to be equal to somebody who just went to high school and that's not something that's going to pay off for and people. the train if you don't go to college they say get some kind of training at mm -hmm. least something that you can do you have to or learn learn a trade something you could become an entrepreneur and there are there are people who are entrepreneurs who do not I know one I'm thinking about right now she did not have a college education but she learned as much as she could and she went on with her passion she's doing very very well <laughs> I'm sorry, and I agree with you that, that, that right now the access to information, the access to education, that there, there are ways that people can get better access. In 66, you couldn't pull up a tablet and say, well, let me read these, right, all these periodicals. Right, right. I'd have to go to the store and buy however many papers. But there, because there's so much access to information, getting back to what we were talking about, I, I think they're pushing these kids in ways that we have all have to get this next LeBron James. His mom was a single mom, and we don't, I don't know how he was raised, but we know he was pushed toward the NBA. Thank God it worked out for him. Right. But how many LeBron Johnsons are in the, in the, in the street that can't play right. at the level of basketball and get put on ESPN from Akron, Ohio, play against Texas. I'm or somebody that. who's going to go, I was getting ready to say Star Search, but American Idol, American Idol. they're going to become right. this singing star. Just so happens the young lady from the school where I used to teach, she's in the top 10 mm -hmm. right now. <laughs> yes, but uh, yeah, that, that's Well, pretty. you better give her a shout out so she can get her votes in. Malaya, yeah, Malaya. vote for Malaya. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> vote for Malaya. She's, uh, if I was still teaching, she'd be in my musicals. She was in the department. <laughs> but um, Yes, it's very important. We have Theo on the line. Good afternoon, Theo. Well, happy Friday to all of you. Happy Friday. Thank you. I wanted to join in on this conversation. <laughs> this is such an important issue to us as a people and to us as a country. It seems to me that our educational system is being enhanced so that uh, the students will be dumped into the pipeline to prison. Now, talking about here in the city of Detroit, I just heard uh, yesterday that there is a buyout offer because they're trying to get rid of, rid of the best and the seasoned teachers in order to hire, I, I guess, the Teach America group and uh, folks along that line for uh, minimum wage, shall we say. Now, the concern that I have about the system is the elimination of the vocational classes. Mm -hmm. And I'm particularly right, right. sensitive to that right. Benjamin Davis Aerospace where the graduates at 18 had the ability to earn between 60 and $90,000 as an airplane mechanic. They got rid of that, moved uh, the students over to Go Lightly because Go Lightly didn't have all of its uh, paperwork in order. But anyway, to have vocational classes removed eliminates options. Our young people many times don't even have an idea of what they want to do or what they want to be. But when they're exposed to vocational classes, sometimes the light comes on, oh, 
I want to have a business selling this, or I, I want to work for that. You follow what I'm saying? Yes, yes, yes. Sometimes these children find what they used to, they like. We had classes that, uh, we had the vote <coughs> classes, the auto mechanic shop and all of that stuff, but we even had a restaurant where students mm -hmm. learned to prepare food, they learned to wait tables, they did management, they did all of these things. Not to say they were going to do that right. afterwards, but then that might be, you know, something that they would want to go into. Absolutely. It, it, well, I was going to say, sometimes. It, it, the, the, the excitement that they, they show when they learn about the kinds of things that are available. There are parents who will expose their children to options, but there may not be many who do that. But in the schools, when they had those vocational classes, our young people got an idea as to what was going on in the world. That's kind huh? of what Adam was saying, that the schools should be something that we could go to and say, well, we're going to take care of you. Everything. Wrap around, wrap around services. I mean, my dad went to Northwestern. He had wood shop, metal shop, print shop before he started high school. Mm -hmm. So when you look around at all these vacant and abandoned neighborhoods and homes in mm -hmm. your generation, that they, wouldn't they happen because Chris or I could to, walk uh, into that house and say, if I can get on. in, I can fix everything in here. And if I can't, Chris is a plumber and I'm an electrician and Darren's a carpenter, and so we had the skills in the neighborhood to fix a house. Today, you just don't have that, so you got to pay somebody to do something, and you can't afford to That's do right. that. Right. And, and, and even you start your own company. A lot of our young, young people get excited about that. And um, you have, like, I'm sure you know, Brenda, when you had students in, in uh, your classes and your programs and your plays, you could see the ones that got excited about it and, and wanted to make it their life career. Yeah, I mean, you give them, they have that training and they get the courage to kind of venture off and do those things. And I, and I think and that, at, uh, oh, oh, Chris? I was going to say, I think that even before the training, Absolutely. a good thing that um, um, you know, Ms. Theo um, touched on. I know there was conversation. That uh, she touched on was exposure. Right. And mm -hmm. if you look at the generation gap as far as exposure from even 30 years ago, mm -hmm. what was they, in the community, what kids walking down the street would see versus what they walk down the street and see today. We talked about um, being a cook. Right. Now only restaurants they see in the neighborhood are Coney Islands. You know, they see Coney Islands, they see party stores and, uh, you know, barbershops and beauty salons. And all of these things aren't really much to strive for. And so I think that exposure really needs to be one of the first conversations as far as students. I can remember, you know, in elementary school taking field trips and getting exposed to a lot of different stuff that wasn't in my community and 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 frankly um 30 years ago there was a lot more in the in the heart of detroit than there is now and so there was a need then but there's even more of a need now to to expose kids that you know a restaurant is not a coney island you know hmm. and that um a handyman is not necessarily a master carpenter just a, you, and so you need to open the eyes of these kids and part of that is going talking to kids if you have any type of success in your field you don't have to have a PhD to go in and volunteer to talk to these kids because I know pipe fitters plumbers um, mm -hmm. carpenters who are making six figures and I know people with you know with far less uh, academia making less and so they need to know that there are other there options, are options you know right. with oh, regard to having a successful do. future right well thank you Theo we no longer have children in, in uh, 12 but Theo? we do care about the community. We have to continue to fight for them. Right, right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, Thank you. have a Thank good you. one. Uh, now we're going to go quickly to the international and national news. I mean, this was such a great conversation. We could talk on that for days, and everybody had great views on that. And the fact that the schools are not offering what they need to offer. and it just seems to be getting less and less and less. I just, I don't understand. I just don't understand, especially in the urban areas right now. I, how, well, let me ask this question before we, how do you think we can make it better? I think you get what you pay for. So, it, and it's you not just, money and it's not just put your money, it's your time, it's your effort, and it's your children. Right. A lot of folks will say, oh, I want public schools and I want public schools to be great but they're unwilling to put their kids into that school. You know, my wife and I had this discussion when we were thinking about where we we're gonna live. And I lived three blocks from my parents. My wife and I both went to public schools. 
We both went to Ivy League schools. But for us, we want our kids to be able to go to public schools and the schools we went to. And that's what makes schools good is that you send your kids back to your neighborhood. You live in your neighborhood and you give them the benefit of your successes and your failures. And it was so interesting when I taught in Highland Park, because <clears throat> I taught in Highland Park for 18 years, and I was teaching the children of students I had. You know, everybody mm -hmm. wanted them to come through, and it's funny, when I went on to work in Southfield, there were Highland Parkers who came there, so you gotta take Miss Perry, Miss. I was doing mm -hmm. generations of students, but the, the parents knew they could rely on certain teachers to give their children a good education. Mm -hmm. And that's important. And some parents make the mistake of moving their kid from this school to this school to this school. I understand if this school isn't good, move them. But sometimes you got to go come into the school and get and what you come in, volunteer, let's see what's happening. Let let me get in here because I know I was a parent that really got into the schools when my kids were going into it. And could I just add one thing that I think is a caveat we don't talk about. It's not just when you have kids in school, because then it's too late. I'm not going to take any chances with that school with my kid. I've got to fix the school before I have kids. So if Chris is saying, all right, we're going to have kids in five years, bet, then we need to send our kids to the same school. And we need to go identify that school and say, how do we fix the problems in this school so in five years my I can kid. convince my child, I can convince my wife that we're not taking a risk. That's right. you got to fix it before. That's true. Yeah. What were you well, oh, Yeah, I agree with you. But you, if you don't have kids, you wouldn't know that the school is not bad because a uh, school is not good because you're not in there. But it's it's what I what I think I what I most agree with you on is it's the sense of community. Mm -hmm. um, and for a, a number of years, we've lost that sense of community because I'm chasing either this house or I'm chasing um, whatever it is that I'm chasing out of the community, out of the city of Detroit, or out of those those areas where I couldn't walk down the street and get into trouble with because I knew Miss Smith and mm -hmm. I knew Mr. Ellis and right, I knew Miss Anderson right, right. would get to me. Right. Well, we've lost that. We, you know, I can no longer talk to this, ch this person's kid. I, it, this kid doesn't have the respect to talk to someone, to an adult saying, right. you know, my mama tell me, no, 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 no. Our but, neighbors gonna, used to could chastise me. Exactly. And they then told, you get, then they you get told on me and, right. and then I get actually get got in Chastised yeah. for being chastised, not for the event, but for being chastised by somebody else. Right. So, you know, we've lost that sense of community and that's where. I think that it, there are several layers to it too, because if you look at our schools now, they remind you of prisons. Mm. You know, there's, there's uh, a, a sense of keep what's out, out, and keep you students in. And there needs to be more of a dialogue, more of an interaction, because this is a community. Mm -hmm. You know, these kids honestly feel like school is jail. They're like, you know, I'm going to, you know, serve eight. Not eight years, but eight hours. <laughs> and so there needs to be, and, and I understand the, the dynamic of um, making sure the kids are safe, safe. And, and, and things, but I think that, uh, it would be interesting to see if there can be some type of conduit of, of, of resource, whether it's talent, um, financial resource, or time between surrounding businesses and if they'd be open to it. But it's all in what the administration and the staff make of that school. That school could be boarded up and have one window in it, but if you make that community inside that school something that the kids want to come to school for, you know. Uh, there was a young lady here this morning she was uh, telling Michelle that she took my class all four years because I had the kind of class you could take year after year because it made her want to come to mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. And we have to have a, a school environment where our children want to come to school, mm -hmm. where they enjoy school. Right. And when kids are trudging along to go to school, you know that that could be a potential dropout. And, and, and it's obviously pointing to something bigger than that, that school, but we want to make these kids self-sufficient. We don't make, want to make them dependent on a teacher, a class, or a school. So that when they leave that school, now they don't have that, that, that backbone and they're like, man, you know, if I was only back in such and such as class, then I'd be okay. We want to let them know that there's a big world out there and, and yeah, I know you're going to love Miss um, Perriman's class, but you're going to have to leave. And yeah, you know. but you know, it's funny because I have students who graduated 35 years ago still calling me. So, you know, but I've made myself available like that. But let's go on to our next, uh, oh, that's such a strong topic. We need to have a panel on that. Um, Flight 70, I hear they haven't found it yet. Uh, any theories about what went on? 
I, 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 <laughs> I think the theories have been exhausted, um, whether it's, you know, national media coverage or even just uh, social media coverage. Mm. Um, I think that, you know, what's uh, maybe lost in there is that there are, um, you know, families out there who are looking for their loved ones. And, right. and, and it really doesn't make sense in this day and age um, of the, you know, technological uh, advances that there can't be any type of conclusive answer that's given. And so, I, you know, my heart goes out to them, and I'm still curious as far as what really happened. It, it just makes it um, really suspicious. And I think that the times that we live in and the way that people look at governments and potential, uh, you know, devious, um, you know, or cover-up, it only lends people to even raise, you know, their eyebrow even more saying, no, something's fishy. Just one ping. That's all it takes is one ping, I think. And, and, and I, we were talking about this earlier, how I, I, I lost my, uh, my iPhone and I hit my one, one app on my phone and it started sending this ping out, ping, ping, ping. This sends it out and I can find it. We're talking about an aircraft. We're talking about something that's a city block long with hundreds of people or at least 100 people on it and they can't find it. I, I, I you know, without being an aviator or anything, I just think there's something nefarious about it. I think if you can turn off that transponder, that signal that it sends out after 9-11, and we can, you can manually turn that off, I think that's a huge problem. I think that's something that should have been taken care of, you know, years ago, 10 years ago, 13 years ago. You should not be able to turn off the button or hit a button to say this, you can't the see this plane. The locator button. The locator, you just, just shouldn't be that. Even if you did manually turn it off, it would seem to me that, okay, there's now, a, a, there's now some ping that will come out that, will, that we can locate that because if it's headed towards this neighborhood or this city or this yeah. capital building, we should be able to do that. The discrepancy um, in uh, the uh, reports, um, Malaysian government or officials saying one thing, the U.S. saying another mm -hmm. thing, I think that only leads to people even um, having even a more skeptical view right. of, of what they're um, getting reported um, as far as the, the, the whereabouts or the lack thereof of this airline and uh, you know we'll see how it plays out mm -hmm. um, you know I honestly think that as much time as went on now that this will eventually just quietly die off and it's unfortunate but it raises some interesting questions you know like you said uh, with regard to because we live in a global world now it's, it's not like we don't fly to other countries and um, interact um, you know globally and so I want to make sure that if if I'm flying right. on a Malaysian airline, that I'm just as <laughs> you know uh, you know accounted for as uh, as if I was flying on. Um, you know, I fly on Spirit because of the way my bank account is set up. Uh, <laughs> American I Airlines I, is. is, is uh, I agree. I can't go on Spirit. My knees hit the, hit the backs of those seats. Well, you're in first class anyway, so it doesn't matter. Well, anyway, <laughs> um, very importantly, before we show our, we're going in five minutes. We're going to show part of the other interview. The Civil Rights Act turns 50 this year. Uh, Darren, can you speak to that? 50. I mean, this. this the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was the landmark legislation in this country. I mean, it, we, in the commission, we call it a majestic piece of, of legislation because what it, what it did, it said that uh, race, color, religion, national origin, and gender had no place in uh, the decisions that you make for employment, employment for housing, I mean, and for education. It, that's the legislation of the land. They, you know, we, I, I'm. Sure, I'm gonna. I'm sure I'm, people are throwing things at the television now, saying, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." But this person did this. This person called me this name. This person used the N word at work. The legislation is there, so that shouldn't happen. So the legislation is fine. It's the attitude, and that's what keeps our doors open. Is that it's an attitude of fear, and once we change that, that's what. But this legislation 50 years ago, I, would this pass today? No. Exactly. Right. What could so right. you imagine right. what was right. going on then with something like we're not we're, could this pass and then that's why it's such a majestic bill that's why this was such a majestic bill because it, without that how many opportunities would you be have would you have the opportunity to have your show now to be a teacher then I mean there was it's just so oh, many yeah. things that came out of that 
Civil that was just such a that was such a crazy day when that happened. I remember the day, and well, I was on the bus going to South Carolina, so I remember <laughs> that day and going to South Carolina and, no, and noticing the stools being taken up from the restaurants and so forth and so on. But like you said, would it pass today? I don't think it don't would think it either. Could. I don't think it could. Uh, but why do you say that? Let's say that. Why do you say that? And well, you we, we, this is the, the the most advanced country in the world. I mean, we have all of the all of the, the technological advances, we have all the automobile, every advance in the world, but we can't get our own people health care. We can't make sure that we have how many millions of people that are homeless, but we're the richest country in the, in the world. We have how many people go hungry every day, but we're the richest country in the world. We can't seem to solve those problems. We can't even get uh, simple, we can't even get a judge passed because the Congress and because because this, uh, I don't want, I want to make sure this president looks bad. So I'm not going to, uh, whatever it is, I'm not going to, I'm not going to vote for it. Adam, why did you say that? I don't think we're committed to doing things. I think I'm committed to doing something. I think Chris is committed to doing something. Darren's committed to doing something. You're committed to doing something. I think the generational difference is that people today believe that they can be successful by themselves. And to some extent, I think that that has proven true. When you talk about a LeBron James, LeBron James is successful himself. When you talk about people who are making it today, it's that sudden stroke of genius or that innovation or I was better than everybody else my entire life or I got lucky. But it wasn't, <clears throat> I don't think you see enough folks who recognize that the reason that they are successful or not successful is the cast around them. You know, today right. you can win right. a championship by yourself because everybody's playing by themselves. You know, 50 years ago, you could only win a, t you know, a championship right. if everybody on the team was better than everybody else on everybody else's team. And, and I think that has been the big change. And if we're going to tackle some of these big issues, we've got to come together. I mean, we came together in an incredible way for the president to get elected. Yes. But every year since then and every year in it between, we off. said no dice. Right. Right, absolutely. I now, Adam, I know that you'll have to uh, run, but we're going to get ready. I'm going to introduce our uh, piece that we're going to, our special interview with Valerie Jarrett, Senior Advisor to the President of the United States and Assistant to the President for Public Liaison and Intergovernmental Affairs in the Obama administration. That sounds like a job you may have, Adam, one day. <laughs> you know, when you, what do you think? You never know. Uh, so we're, I want to thank you for joining us. And you have to come back and talk about Hans. Hans, Hans Woodlands, anytime. Hans Woodlands. So I'll make that appointment. We'll make that appointment. So if uh, Mr. Tyler is ready, or when, it, we'll, this is an interview about the Affordable Care Act. And everyone, please listen to it. It's just a few minutes, and we'll be right back with you. Good afternoon, everybody. Good day to you. This is Brenda Perryman bringing you a special feature right here at WHPR, where on the line I have the advisor to the president, Ms. Valerie Jarrett. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Brenda. I'm delighted to be with you. How are you today? Oh, fine. We had about 10 inches of snow, so. Again? Oh, yeah. my gosh. It was Aren't like, you just getting sick of it? Oh, it has worn us out. But It you is know, time for winter to be over. But anything we could do to help with the Affordable Care Act and with the Moms Knows Best program. Well, I don't know about you. I'm a mom, and I have to think that I know best. That's what I've been telling my daughter for her whole life. And right. I'm we a mom. all know that young too. people listen to their mothers, they trust their mothers, and they know that their mothers have their best interest at heart. And yes. so you're right. This week we've launched Mom Knows Best, and we have moms all over the country talking to their children and their family members saying, this is a wonderful opportunity for those of you who do not have health insurance. Many for the first time to get health insurance by signing up by March 31st. And you can go on our website, healthcare.gov. It's working fine. No wait. Go on there or else you can dial 1-800-318-2596. That's 1-800-318-2596. Look at the options that are available for you for health insurance in your marketplace and pick the one that works best for you. And don't wait until March 31st. Sign up today. Well, I've already had a young lady from here 
on a couple of weeks ago, and that's all we talked about was the Affordable Care Act and some of the workshops and everything that were available in this area. And I know in the Detroit area, there's some other ones that are coming up. I'm not yes. sure when they are. Yes, actually, um, this Saturday, March 15th, at the American Indian Health and Family Services Center, which is at 4880 Lawndale Street in Detroit, um, you can go in. They're going to have a whole enrollment event. You'll be able to sign up on the spot and take advantage of it. But also, you can, if you don't feel like coming out, you can go to the website or you can use the phone number. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible as so that easy. everybody has the peace of mind of knowing that if they do get sick or they are in an accident, that they're covered. And we know that bad things happen to good people. You just never know when life is going to throw you a curveball. So take, your, take the time to protect yourself. Most people can get it for cheaper than a cell phone bill. And certainly, if you can pay for your cell phone, you can pay to insure your body. Absolutely, because like you said, life happens sometimes. And a couple of months ago, a friend of mine was involved in a car accident. He didn't have insurance. Uh, and so it was almost secondary the way they treated him at the hospital. It, really? It, it, yes. And they need you need to have insurance. And the f thing about it is he was going to sign up in December, and unfortunately he passed away. Oh, I'm so sorry. And well, that's awful. Yes, it is. But I just watched how they treated him at, at the hospital. And I just think, you know, the whole thing with uh, with having health care, it just really is so important. It is so important, and we need people to go and get used to getting regular checkups on an annual basis. Don't wait until you have a symptom that's so acute that you go to the emergency room. Go in and get that important pre preventive care, and particularly to the women, the moms out there now, thanks to the Affordable Care Act, you can have your annual checkup for screenings for cancer, and um, you can get contraception um, without any copay whatsoever. And oftentimes, moms, we put ourselves last, and we take care of our children and our spouses and our parents and our grandparents, and then if there's any money left over, then maybe we'll take care of ourselves. But now, you don't have to worry about any out-of-pocket expenses that comes with the standard package under the Affordable Care Act. Because after the age of 26, doesn't the young person come off of their parents' insurance? They do. Now, we, we extended it up till 26 under the Affordable Care Act, but at 26, when you turn 26... Young people do have to leave their parents' plans, and so now, anticipating that, shop and find the insurance that's going to be available to you so that there isn't any gap. I mean, something can happen in one day. We get so many letters from people here at the White House where they've written in and they've said, you know, I signed up for insurance on December 29th, and don't you know by January 3rd I had this acute pain, and then it was covered, and now I'm being treated. And if it hadn't been for the insurance, I would have either – had to sell my home to pay for the cost of the treatment, right? or I wouldn't have gone to the hospital at all, and then who knows what might have happened to And pre-existing um, ailments are covered, too, right? Yes, pre-existing, and this is a really important point. I'm so glad um, that you mentioned this, Brenda, because historically, insurance companies could discriminate against people, drop their coverage, charge them higher premiums, all kinds of things could happen to you. If you had, and it could be anything from asthma or something more severe, high blood pressure, cancer, insurance companies, it was at their discretion to determine what, what, what they considered a pre-existing condition. And so just when you need the insurance the most, the insurance company would say, no, you know, you're not going to be covered. And so people would often stay in a job that they didn't want because they knew they couldn't change employers because the new insurance company wouldn't give them coverage. And so now if you wanted to go and start your own business or change jobs or whatever, you have the flexibility of knowing that insurance companies may no longer discriminate against anybody. It's a huge benefit. Absolutely, and I really appreciate you coming on and telling Detroit and Michigan about the Affordable Care Act and the moms. We have to get out there. We have to talk to our children. Isn't we that do, and you know what? I would even so, go so far as to say it's okay to nag them a little about this. Because yes. these young people, they think they're invincible, and they're not. And if you just stay on them every single day until March 31st, I know you will get your children signed up. And there's no better gift that a that an adult child can give their parent than the peace of mind of knowing that their parent doesn't have to worry about them if something happens, and, that they'll and, have that important medical treatment, affordable and, quality medical treatment that's provided under the Affordable Care Act. I'd quickly like to say anyone who has heard 
some misinformation about it, go to the workshops, call, what's that number again, Valerie? Um, the number is 1-800-318-2596. And you find out, or you could go on White House, wait. WhiteHouse.gov, healthcare.gov. Healthcare, I was going to say WhiteHouse.gov. <laughs> That's fine, no, it's healthcare.gov, and every, um, every state will have insurance plans that are available in your marketplace that you could, and it's so easy. I mean, it's, you just go on and take your time and pick out what works best for you. And that's another reason to go on today because it might take you, you might want to think about it. Well, you know, there are five choices, let's say, in your area. Well, I want to think about which one's best for me, and I'll, I'll call back tomorrow, and that's when I'll decide. So don't jam yourself by waiting until the 11th hour. Absolutely. Do it today. Absolutely. And sometimes it's much cheaper than you think it is. So yes, it is. Yes, it is. And when you consider what the cost of a severe illness or even a minor trip to the emergency room can oh, bankrupt you. Yes, so don't can. gamble with your security, your financial security, and that of your families. When there's a choice waiting for you, all you got to do is sign up. Well, we here at WHPR in Detroit, we compliment you, and we are so happy that you have come to us, and we will play this over and over and over. Well, thank you so much, Brenda. We appreciate your support and for you caring about your listening audience and their health. Oh, I do. I do. I do. So well, you have a you. great day. Yes, we'll trudge through the snow and maybe one day it'll be spring. Spring is right around the corner. I can feel it coming. I heard that. <laughs> okay, thank Take you. Take care, dear. Bye-bye. So everyone, we have to sign up for, white, for healthcare.gov. We have to have some kind of health insurance because, believe me, if you don't have it, they treat you a certain way. You become, you're really like a second-class citizen when you have an emergency. So we'll see you next time. I hate to come back and I'm talking for I That was a little off sync, you know. It was like, but no, I thought it was a wonderful, wonderful interview with Valerie Jarrett. She was very, very nice and really, we need to have health care. You need to get signed up for health care. And we're going to go on with the rest of our topics. Uh, the Northland death was the young man who died at Northland. That was ruled an accident. But it could have been prevented. I, I, I absolutely think it could have been prevented. I mean, first of all, with attitude. The, the, the store owner said he felt threatened. And so, and now he has police and, and all these other activities and security coming after him because he felt threatened. What was, the, what was such a threat that they had to kill this kid? I don't, I don't, I don't know all the story. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't know all the facts. I haven't seen all the facts. Well, but he felt threatened. Well, and, and, and you know, it, it leaves open to interpretation. Um, but I think that there, there could have been something different done on both sides, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and... I don't know if you've been to Northland lately, um, and I don't get there as much as I once did, but it's not the mall that I grew up cherishing. No, and so um, what you have is you have, is you have a um, small uh, group of business owners who have um, still doing business there, and, and the patrons, um, you know, a lot of times don't feel as safe as they should in there because what you have an atmosphere that is, is not family fr friendly in my opinion. Um, and, um, you know, uh, one of the last times that I was in there, I, s I smelled a, a, you know, a very strong s uh, smell of marijuana smoke in the mall. And so I don't know specifically what happened that day, and hopefully more t details will come out, but I do know this. I do know that um, business owners at times um, uh, are prejudiced against young mm -hmm. black men, but I also know that there are times when our young black men have to be smarter. And so I'm looking at it from both sides. I don't know uh, if this young man could have just left. I don't know if he was confrontational with the security guards. Um, you know, I was taught that, you know, you got to know sometimes in, in life, you got to know when to hold your cards. You got to know when to fold your cards. And sometimes, yeah, you, ha you have the right to do something, but it's not always to your advantage to, to, to do certain things. And so, again, I'm not the main issue here is that this, this young um, gentleman, McKenzie, he was killed that day, or he died that day. It was, it was, it was ruled as an accident. Um, but uh, 
You know, but he not, kept on saying, let me up, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And they did not let up on him, you know. And they could have gotten him up. Why can't you, you just stand this young man up? And, 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 and you're right. I agree with you. There, I've, I've not frequented Northland, nor Fairland, gotta, for that matter. Gotta go uh, check out Sibley's shoes, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going. But I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just a little wary that, that you know, this could have been my, my son. And my son could have gone into Northland to to go to Sibley's uh, to get some shoes and Sibley's could, still open. I don't know that. <laughs> no, no, they're not. They're not. <laughs> to get some shoes and 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 what we and and could he have been per perceived as threatening? One of my my oldest son has locks. My youngest son has a Timmy or, or a haircut. Right. And and so you know what what does what does that what does that threat look? Does that threat look like a Trayvon Martin walking down the street? Mm -hmm. Because that's the same thing he used. I felt I felt threatened. Does that threaten look like those boys that are sitting in the car listening to music loud, and this person comes over mm -hmm. to the car? Jordan Davis affair. Right, right, and says I felt threatened, and he, you know, it, is is a hung jury on that. So, wh is it the fact that the skin was black that made him threatened, or I mean, what is it that's creating these threats? I, it's it's erased. It, Definitely the questions that, are in, that I'm thinking about, um, you know, I think that what makes this different is that there were supposed to be trained personnel that responded to this. And so and there's a higher standard that exactly. they should be held accountable exactly. to. And um, quite frankly, these guys have hours and hours of, of, of police in this mall. And so this, sh this wasn't their first time probably handling the situation. So they should know um, proper procedure protocol mm -hmm. on how to, whether it be detained or apprehend, uh, um, or as the movie say, protect and serve, or observe and protect, you mm -hmm. know, um, we don't know. Um, and, and, and I don't want to go out on a limb and just, you know, say that, you know, every uh, security officer there was out of line. Um, I think more t details will come out. But again, it raises the question um, that if this was a, a, a young white um, patron, um, in or Novi Mall, yeah, in, uh, in, uh, in you know, or if it was a different mall, would it be perceived differently? Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, you know, so we'll wait and see. You know, um, thoughts and prayers go out to uh, family, um, exactly. Mr. Cochran's family, and uh, we'll just have to wait and see how this uh, uh, plays out. Well, I think that I've seen some things happen in Northland the last time I was there with my students that. I mean, it's ridiculous. They do have a lot of things going on out there that shouldn't be. But I just say that they, I think together with the force and everything that caused this young man to die, mm. I'm just going to say it. Yeah. Now, I heard that Judge Wade McCree has filed paperwork to run for judge again. And remember, he was kind of brought up on charges for really compromising his position as judge. Uh, plus, he took a nude selfie of himself, and, and it was sent to a married bailiff. There were other things that went on. He got into a personal relationship with a um, with somebody who had, boy, what had she? It was, she her was husband a, was, uh, her ex-husband or something. She, child, she was a plaintiff in, in, in front of him, right. right? and they had entered into a personal relationship. I think that this just gets more and more bizarre, and I don't think he's doing himself any any favors. Um, public opinion um, has been almost cast, in my opinion, on this guy again in, in politics. Name recognition goes a long way. Uh, but I think that, you know, you wouldn't want to be the guy that lose to, 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 <laughs> to, to, to uh, Wade McCree. Right. I think he has to, in the event that he can, because they, they have not ruled on whether he's going to be suspended or not. So he has to do that. Uh, and I, I absolutely admired him. I, I really feel that this fall from grace for him is a tremendous fall. I, 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 I've had him speak to some of my children before, and, I, and it, it pains me that they now recognize him in the news as, oh, that's judge that took the selfie. I feel, I, yeah. I'm, I'm really praying for this this what thing. I but thought, teach, it, he, he acted a like a man too. going through a midlife crisis. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, and as a society, I think that, you know, a lot of times we can be borderline hypocritical because uh, we're all human. And if, if the light would shine on us at our most inopportune times, what would be our reputation? 
And so I'm not making any excuse for him. But what right. I'm saying is, is that people make mistakes and we can choose to either judge them for the rest of their life based off the mistake that they made or we can have some flexibility and see the perspective where they're at now. Again, the office of judge has a high standard, a high for, standard for that. Standard. And, um, and um, historically, you cannot make these type of mistakes and expect to get um, uh, support from voters. But, you know, I think, you know, just mirroring that is how do we view people when we catch them in the act of right, doing something? Right. Well, you know, unfortunately, this hour has gone by so quickly. Oh <laughs> I just hate how it goes by so quickly. <laughs> and I'd like to thank you, Darren, for joining the table today. My I pleasure. mean, we really didn't get through everything as usual. We get into this education debate, and I think this is a panel we need to have. We need to keep talking about it because things are not as they should be. Mm, because you got a better education and you got a better education than a lot of the young people are getting today. So thank you everybody for joining us for Table Talk with Brenda Perryman. Sign up for the Affordable Care Act and you have a good weekend. See you next week. Let's bring the 